is explored through um, a mystery which is set in Brooklyn. And prior to the, you know, within the current narrative, there are uh, travel episodes where the character's past is shared, um, his travels around America, which precede his arrival in Brooklyn. And I like these sort of travel pieces because they are a little bit pulpy and a little bit raunchy and hopefully lyrical at times. And most importantly, I hope they really provide some insight into this person, who this person is. Okay? Um, the two segments of the travel episodes I'll read tonight. Um, the first one takes place um, between Iowa and Colorado and ends in Texas. And the second one, which picks up later in the novel, um, starts with Texas and ends in Louisiana. In Iowa, I worked at a shotgun bar full of losers. A ramshackle joint surrounded by cornfields on the outskirts of Ames. All day long, I served beer and cans and liquor with ice to down on their luck men and their on-again, off-again girlfriends. They all had something wrong with them. Addiction or physical disability or personality disorder. The owners sold pills and took bets on the side. And many of the hapless would come to the bar to drink even though they were in the hole to the boss for bills or pets, or pets, bets, or both. If they failed to fork over their drinking money, I'd have to take it from them. And this was never pretty because even the puniest scumbag will come up with some courage to save his drinking funds. It was a rotten job, but I had nowhere else to go. I lived in the cab of an abandoned tractor trailer down the road from the bar. I slept in the storage space behind the seats and kept my things stacked on the dash. During the day, I'd run the cornfields. With the shafts and loose husks tearing at my shoulders, I'd storm the open rows until my lungs began to seethe. From a pump well, I'd take cool, cool water from the deep earth. Then I'd pump rounds of push-ups off the pure soil. The smell of minerals filled my nose as my chest and back tightened. I could feel myself growing like crops under the Iowan sun. I kept at it nearly every day into the late afternoon. Before work, I'd sit on the tin roof of the bar, smoke cigarettes, and watch the rows of corn swim with wind. Crows flap through the steady air to rest on black wires and consider me. In the distance, dust from tractors billowed above a river that wended through a field sown with heather. Enormous cloud formations, like white buffalo, roamed the great plains of the sky, floating giant pools of shadow on the vast flatlands. And there on the tin roof, the Iowa sunset in my eyes, I'd think of my abandoned mother and my dead brother and my missing father. I'd been out on my own for a while then and wondered when I wouldn't feel so alone. The owner had a wife, a strawberry blonde with cowboy boots and rodeo skirts. She was an easy 20 years older than me, but her age only evident in the skin that gathered around her elbows and the lines that webbed her eyes when she smiled. She was sweet and moody as a child. She made faces like a little girl. Most nights around closing time, she'd saunter in from somewhere, her colored skirt swinging through the muted lights of the bleary room. She'd sit on a stool at the end of the bar, smoke my cigarettes, and sing sad songs. While I tossed the late night losers, she'd take a fifth of whiskey to the boss in back and not return until the bottle was done. When her husband passed out in his chair, his feet on his desk and an antique pistol across his lap, she'd take me to the pool table with a warm bar towel. She'd peel off my clothes and wash my drawn skin. Then, with childlike voice and sweet blinking eyes, she'd ask me to do things I'd never imagined. No matter what we did, how deranged or complicated or possibly illegal, she kept her boots on the whole time. In the cresting dawn, on the hood of her car in the parking lot, she'd braid my hair and ask about the previous night's business of booze and bets and pills. She'd convinced me that part of the profit was mine, due to the work I did for the boss beyond fixing drinks. Her math was a mystery, but her reasoning seemed right. So as the sun rose on the honest earth and its honest people, I'd hand my mistress the money and pills I'd stolen from her husband. She said she'd hold it for a rainy day. One stormy night, amidst the hailstorms of August, the owner stumbled from the back in a stupor. The pellet rattle on the tin roof having roused him from his bourbon dreams. He came into the bar room rubbing his eyes, spotted me standing there naked, 
next to his wife who was on the pool table with a long neck bottle of Galliano stuck in her ass. He blinked a few times. Sorry. He blinked a few times, apologized with a gesture of his hand, then walked back into the office. He returned a moment later, firing his old pistol with a shaky hand. The Colt pumped rounds all over the room and the bottle of Galliano smashed to the floor, leaking its syrupy liquid. The boss stepped closer, squinted as he aimed, and blasted the lamp above the pool table, throwing green glass everywhere. The girl and I ducked and ran, both of us naked except for her cowboy boots that clacked across the wooden floor. Bullets ricocheted around the room as the owner followed and fired. When we reached the door, I heard him curse as he slipped in the spilled liquor and squeezed one last round through the mirror behind the bar. We tore through the frozen rain into her Volkswagen. With the keys in the ignition, she started the car and spun gravel through the length of the parking lot until we fishtailed onto the rural road. We were dry and naked, hail and glass falling from our hair as the car split the fields, headlights on the frozen rain that exploded off the hood like popped corn. We drove dead west in total silence before she said something about going home. I woke in the daylight, 60 miles from Denver. She checked us into a motel on a ridge above a truck stop. The air was warm and bright, the mountains topped by snow. Her trunk was full of cash and pills, and we dealt amphetamines out of our room and spent mornings at the pool, swimming and taking sun, drinking champagne from plastic glasses. In our motel room after lunch, we'd have sex without stunts or gadgets. She told me we'd be leaving for Northern California soon, where we'd live on grapes and love in the hills and hollows of the wine country. But first, before we left, she'd have to tell me about her motherless childhood, about being the daughter of a two-bit rodeo owner from Colorado. She said she was only miles from a home she hadn't seen since she was 17. She told me how she grew up the center of attention, a rodeo princess adored by the ticket holders, but ignored by her father, a man who viewed the world through the lens of profit and performance. She was heralded in public, but invisible after the dust had settled and the crowd's gone home. She told me how she did everything she could to gain her father's attention, and when she came of age and became a beauty, she first flirted with and then fucked every hired hand she could coax into the barn. Still, her father paid no mind, until the day he caught her in the hay, riding a midget rodeo clown named Little Willie. <laughs> the owner lashed his daughter into pulp and then sent her limping into adulthood all on her own. She'd been married four times throughout the middle of America, failing again and again to find a kind of love she had never known, to earn an attention that could not be found. In the pale light of our motel room, in the tangled sheets of her bed, I'd finger the whip marks on her hip as she hummed a sad song. Each drunken night, we'd talk about California, and I'd wonder if we'd ever leave. We returned from the pool one afternoon, burst through the door with her legs around my torso and a sunburned nipple in my mouth. A dusty man with a drooping mustache sat across the bed in a wrinkled shirt and jeans. He chewed on a match and squinted against a flood of light. He uncrossed his boots and put them on the floor, shook the dust from his bones. Get dressed, Belinda, he said with a craggy voice. He pulled a revolver from his shoulder strap and pointed the barrel dead center at my chest. I'm supposed to kill you, he said, twitching the barrel. The mustache man waved me aside and led the red-headed rodeo girl to his pickup truck. He threw her bags in the flatbed, hitched her Volkswagen to his toe, and climbed inside the cab. She waved a hand out the window as they drove into the yellow afternoon. That evening, I bribed the trucker with a bag of pills and we chomped black beauties and barreled through the western night up and over mountain passes bathed in ghostly light, down through canyons as bare and blasted as the face of the moon. And as the sun rose on the desert, we killed everything in our way, leaving jackrabbits and snakes and armadillos flattened on the lonely road. And by the time we reached Texas, I'd forgotten about the...